Coffee time. Coffee time with the funny farm. Lots going on. Definitely need a timeout. <laughs> These are my good timeouts doing this as well. There's a lot of elk hunters in the woods right now in North America. A lot. I wonder how many of them are being fed some truth they didn't know about right now this past week. I'll bet you there's a bunch. And uh, I'll tell you what, who knows, right? I mean, who knows how many people right now. This past week or coming up months, well, typical hunting seasons are underway in North America. I wonder how many, how many people are going to be uh, getting slapped in the face with the truth of what's going on. Don't envy them, especially, especially imagine how many A-types are out there that laugh, laugh and scoff at, at um, the truth being shared and then they get drilled with it unexpected in their face, right? You know that's going down. You know that's gone down this week somewhere. I bet my life on it, without a doubt. Crazy, isn't it? Now, <clears throat> more people, more voices, Videos are going to be getting uh, not very frequent really quick because I'm going to be in the bush. So, what do we got? This is titled Something in the Smoky Mountains. I first want to say sharing the story wasn't my idea, but rather my dad's. We were driving a few days ago and he was listening to one of your Sasquatch videos. He said he'd been listening to your channel a lot recently. After that video, we listened to another one about Edgar's story. I can't remember how. We got on the topic of our own Sasquatch stories or unexplained wilderness experiences. If he wants to share the story, if he wants to share the story he told me, I'll let him. But he suggested I share mine with you. I apologize for the length. No apologies needed. Let her rip. First of background, I'm 17. I'm living with my mom, a stepdad, and younger sister. We'd all plan to trip to the Smoky Mountains with my grandma and my aunt, Sid, who's my age. We went up to the Smokies as a sort of a vacation, but also as a meeting point because Sid would be coming back to live with us after the trip. I also think it's important to mention Sid is native. So, after hours of driving, we get to our rental cabin in North Carolina. We all unpacked, settled in after the long drive, got to bed pretty early. I slept in a big beanbag sort of thing in the corner of the upstairs room in a space about five feet wide with a window in each wall of the corner. I put in a drawing of how it looked. Please excuse the terrible craftsmanship. I just needed to get it out real quick so that I had a, so that I had a visual. Neither of the windows had curtains and to the right was a ledge looking over the staircase to the downstairs. Let me see if there's something attached here. There it is. There is the drawing. I'll show it right now. That was shared, all right? There you go. Oops, now I gotta find where I was reading. Sorry about that. There were smaller windows all down the walls of the staircase, all without curtains as well. I couldn't help but feel I was being watched that night, but I chalked it up to just being uneasy in an unfamiliar place and slept it off. The next morning, I was the second person to wake up. My stepdad woke up first. I can't remember what he was doing, but I know it was only him awake besides me. Since I hadn't gotten the chance the day before, I threw on my coat, went outside to look around. It was chilly, but there wasn't any snow where we were. Our cabin was surrounded by woods, and any other houses or people were a long ways away. I figured I had some time to kill before the rest of the family woke up, so I walked maybe 100 yards away just enough so that I could see the cabin and get back fast if I needed to. I'll be honest, I was a little nervous going up by myself like that. I've heard many stories about the, about the Smokies, but it, it just felt like something that wouldn't happen to me. It's one of those things you don't really understand until you experience it for yourself, I guess. Sorry for the little rant, back to the story. I walked maybe 100 yards away from the cabin. I just walked quietly looking at the different fungi I could find and watching the birds. I was faced away from the cabin at this point since I hadn't planned on walking back yet. From in the woods, not too close, but not far either, I heard what sounded like 
My grandma's voice calling for Sid. I mean, it sounded exactly like her. She, was a she has a certain way of calling Sid, where she'd start off, drag out her name in a single, in a sing-songy voice. On top of that, she's from northern Wisconsin. I mention this because even if there were other campers nearby, how likely is it that they would have a northern Wisconsin accent and have someone in their group named Sid? When I heard the voice at first, I just froze. I knew my grandma wasn't awake. When I felt, when I left, sorry, when I left, I knew there was Sid. I thought maybe I was just hearing things or maybe Sid had come outside after me and I just not noticed and grandma was looking for her. My thoughts were cut off by the same voice calling again from the same area of the woods in the exact same tone, same volume level, same exact way as the first time. Almost as if we were being played on a recording. After the second time it hit me that whatever it was, the sound was coming from the complete opposite direction of the cabin. I tried to look around to see if I could see anything in the woods, behind or in the trees, but I couldn't see anything. I remember being overwhelmed with dread and just the intense feeling that I needed to get back. I couldn't think too clearly, but funny enough, I remember thinking to myself about how long it would take me to run 300 feet. I still held hope that I could outrun whatever it was, though I'm sure now I probably wouldn't be able to. I stood there for what felt like forever. Time seemed to stand still, but it was like likely only a few seconds. I walked to the cabin backwards until I was sure I felt safe to turn around. I didn't hear the voice anymore after the second time. Maybe I scared it off or maybe it realized I wasn't sick. I'm not sure. Looking back now, I realized I couldn't hear the birds for a period of time while it was calling for Sid. Almost like everything in the woods went still for a brief moment. I'm getting chills just thinking about it again. When I got back to the cabin, Mike was still the only one awake. I asked him if anyone else had woken up at all while I was gone, even briefly, and he said no. I asked if Grandma had called to sit at all, again no. I asked what he'd been doing, if the TV was on, if he went outside at all. He told me he'd just been sitting on the couch reading and hadn't gone outside, so I was left with no explanation for what I heard. Sid and Grandma were the last two people to wake up, 45 minutes to an hour after I'd come back. When I told Sid about it, I'm not sure if she really believed me or not, but she seemed to think it was funny. I was terrified. I begged her not to go outside. She didn't listen to me and did anyways. So I went with her and I took her dog too. We didn't hear or see anything at that time. The rest of the trip was uneventful, no other stories. My dad brought up an interesting idea when I told him about it, that maybe whatever it was, hers arrived the day before. Maybe at some point I heard grandma call for Sid and we both turned around, so we got confused as to who Sid, who was Sid, and when it saw me in the woods, maybe it thought I was her. I hate to think about what could have happened if it was Sid instead of me, or if I hadn't left when I did. If I'd followed the voice, I'm glad I'm able to tell the story, though. Steve, thank you for sharing everyone's stories. I'm happy that there's good attention being drawn to them, and that so many people have a place to share. I've never thought I'd tell anyone besides Sid and my dad. I know mine wasn't the first interesting story and doesn't involve a sighting or any evidence of what I heard, but just being able to write it all out is nice. Thank you, B. All right, there you go. I'm glad it helped. First off, in the, how many times? There's people hearing names, dogs being called by their name, their own names being called out, and also in similar voices where it was dead on to a voice familiar to them. It's been reported numerous times, right? But everyone, especially our First Nations people as well, have all said they can mimic any sound anytime, and they can also possibly throw the sound to you from an odd direction, possibly, right? Not enough to say was any danger. Like I always say, if somebody was going to be in any kind of a danger from these beings, I don't believe there's anything that can stop them. You know, if, if, if they were trying to lure Sid into the woods, um, if it is, if it was a Sasquatch being, I don't know if that, I don't know if it is. It's like Dave Plytus always stresses, he has never come across anyone who has, any researcher who's ever been harmed ever while looking into these things, 
or any other person's directly, I don't think he's directly found evidence of someone being taken from one of these bush people, I don't think. But um, I would think that if a eight or nine or 10 foot tall being, which can do supernatural things when it wants, if it wanted a human being that was inside a house, we'll use the name, someone called Sid, I don't think they need to lure a human being anywhere. They're just going to walk in there and grab you by the scruff of the neck, drag you down the stairs and out the door. Or punch the wall in and grab you and take off with you. That's what they can do, right? I don't know. It's confusing. But anyway, looking forward to your dad's stories if he's going to write in next. Thanks for writing in. All right, this one's titled Regrets. Hi, Steve. I see no need to reveal my name as it is the ideas that are important. When I try to share my experiences with my friends, they give me that odd look. I've listened to your thoughts and others about a creature called Sasquatch or Sabe and its culture for about a year. The more I listen, the more hooked I get, so I thought I'd present two of my encounter stories and an idea or two. Call my story Regrets. My childhood camp each summer was working in the fields and with livestock on my grandparents' farm on the western edges of the Big Thicket in southeast Texas. Heard that name numerous times. My cousins used to tell me stories about the boogeyman looking in the window at night and panthers screaming. However, we swam in the creek, fished, and ran about when not working with any thought of Sasquatch. The timbered acreage of that land was transferred to me later in my life when my family and interests were in Houston. I began to take my two boys to that property on summer weekends to camp out and repair a fence line. Those several years were great ones for bonding and learning the value of hard work and small wages. We never had any Sasquatch experiences that I recognized, although one time my 10-year-old son and I heard the sound of a large tree hit the ground. He said it must be teenagers. After the boys left home, I continued on weekends to camp I continued on weekends to camp, work, and walk those 25 acres alone. One late afternoon, I was preparing my camp dinner, and I heard those three distinct knocks. I was surprised and curious at the same time. The sound came out of an area that was thick with yopon. I knew there were no teenagers around. Besides, people don't just push around yopon. It's like a green net with tangled branches. I just listened and decided not to return the knocks. I had no idea what that might trigger. No other sounds, nothing happened, but I slept on alert in my tent that night. On this other encounter I had, I decided to hunt deer. I bought a ground level camo blind with window ports and took it up to the property on late summer Sunday afternoon. The reason was to let the deer and the other critters get used to it being there without alarm. I set it up a short distance from the game trail and spring I'd found. I'm kind of big and not agile, but I had just enough time to test it out before the sun set. With difficulty, I climbed into the blind, settled in my chair, and checked my various views. I had just two minutes of getting adjusted when off beyond the game trail, I heard a loud snap. Not a twig crack or a splintering, but the sound of a sizable snap of wood that had been several inches thick. It was not a knock. It was not a forest sound. I sat very still and waited. A lot of thoughts ran through my head. None of them were better than just wait. I can see the area the sound came from about 20 yards away, but small trees and yupon hid whatever it was. About the time I was starting to look elsewhere, the snap sounded again from the same area. And I went to DEFCON 3. Who was playing with me and why? Most of my neighbors were elderly and not the idiot type. Within minutes, the third snap sounded. I'd stayed with my game plan of letting who or whatever it was show itself. But the light was fading fast and I had no choice but to get out of the blind. I tried to act cool as if nothing unusual had happened and walked up the trail out to my truck. The season, that season I saw bucks but only bagged a doe, another story, but no Sasquatch. After years of considering these two events and my Sabe tail collecting, here's the thought to discuss. I think the knocks and the snaps are made by the creature itself. The forests I walk in do not have timber or limbs lying about to make the distinct sound effects I heard. 
Sasquatch are not carrying bats like a policeman may carry a baton. The limbs on the ground are generally are rotting and not solid. Also, the bark on our pine and oak trees would muffle the knocking sound. The knocks I heard were solid and identical. Those snaps were exactly the same in tone, timber and volume. Animals and birds can make some marvelous and strange sounds that seem odd considering their size and shape. Given its reputation as a trickster, why does Sasquatch need trees or bats? One last thought. Was what I heard an invitation? I play chess. I think about consequences and options before I respond to my opponent's move. I recognized his signature Sasquatch knocks immediately and almost laughed since I had heard Sasquatch lore for quite a while. Now here he's at my doorstep, so to speak. I did not respond. Where the snaps were and were the snaps were an, were the snaps were an invitation to come over and see me. I've heard of people going after Sabe or his signs out of curiosity and never seen again. It's not the things in life I did that I regret most, but rather the things I did not do. Author unknown. What if I had knocked back? What if I had investigated those snaps? What fantastic experience did I miss? So Steve, I did make so Steve, did I make the right choices? I'm alive, but with memories that pester me. Thanks for what you're doing. Yours is the best site for exploring Sabe from our home. I hope to hear your thoughts about how best to respond to future invitations other club members might be getting. Keep your balance and don't let this journey overwhelm you. Watch your six, Phil. P.S. Regards to Sarah and all the club members. Okay, Phil. Appreciate it. Um, I've never knocked on a tree in my life, myself. Um, have I never? I've never. I've def never done it. I've heard the knocks twice for sure. Um, I've had so much weird shit happen over how many years. Uh, Sometimes I remember, I forget about some things until I go to that same place again, and then I remember. But one time I was splitting, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, big fir tree rounds, and I mean big rounds, like this, that thick, with a, with a, uh, a wedge and a maul. So I'd start the wedge in the wood, and I'd flip it around to use the maul side of the splitting <clears throat> maul, and, and sledge that, <clears throat> excuse me, wedge into the firewood. And I did that a few times. And I, <clears throat> excuse me, and I paused, and then you could hear a distinct blast coming back down from way up the mountain. And that was near the back of Mount Curry. Mount Curry, where there is nothing but sightings nonstop. Uh, but the one part that makes me curious, you know, if you hear, also hear people saying, they're not making the sounds by hitting trees, they're making it with their mouth. Are they? So you saw that sound come out of the mouth of the Sasquatch is what you're telling us directly, right? I don't know. <clears throat> Have, has, has anybody ever heard the tree knocks in prairie land or in like tumbleweed brush land where there's no timber? Has anybody heard those sounds in those areas? I wonder, right? Um, what comes to mind, what baffles me, not baffles me, but was two years ago, had my friend who also has a degree in psychology with me in the woods, first time hunter or hunting elk. And I've told this numerous times and make a long story short, quadded into the dark, parked, and then we hiked through Aspens for about half a mile, dead silent, dead black, come to a bit of an opening meadow, and then the hunt's on through that meadow, old logging area, another grassy area, and we travel about a mile. And that's when I told him to stay and wait and I would hike back to get the quad to catch up and then we're gonna go another area. And while I was gone, he heard three blasts. What he said sounded like a sledgehammer on a tree exactly where I was headed, or where I, he'd last seen me going into, towards where the quad was. And he asked me what I was doing to the quad when I got back. How come you're banging on the quad? I'm like, I wasn't, man. But I didn't hear a thing. How weird is that? Because I am on, especially when I'm alone in the woods, my senses are on fire, obviously, from knowing what's going on out there for real. And I'm in grizzly bear territory and moose and elk. There's game everywhere. I'm, like, I'm in hunting mode. My senses are on fire. I don't miss nothing. There's no way. I never walk noisy ever. I just don't. Out of habit, I don't walk noisy. I want to hear everything, especially when I'm walking through the timber. Aspens. 
So, how did they do that? How did they do that? I was much closer to the source of the blast on the parent tree with a sledgehammer than my partner was, who was, at that time, I'll bet he was around 700 yards behind me. I'm traveling that way. He's here, I'm there, and hear the sounds coming from the direction I was, I was in. How did that go down? How did he see, hear something crystal clear from around 700 yards and I didn't hear shit? What's up with that? I don't know. But out of habit, I do regularly, regularly <laughs> say either under my breath, out loud at times in the pitch black when I'm hunting, hiking, going to get trail cameras, just leave me alone. Don't scare the shit out of me. Leave me alone. I know you're here. You know I'm here. Let's not ruin it for each other. And I say that all the time. So is there a little respect being shot my way? Maybe. I don't know. So do they do it from hitting trees? I don't know. I haven't a clue. If you were to hit a tree with something, how are you going to stop the sound vibrations traveling to one human being and, and not the other? How do you do that, right? So I don't know. Are we gonna find out? Maybe. We keep going, we will. We keep going, we're gonna find out a lot, which we are, right? Thanks for sending that in, man. Everybody's wheels are turning, which is our uh, motivation. All right, what do we got? It's another short one, titled Sighting. First, I like to say I love listening to the stories and I believe in Bigfoot and aliens. But what do I have to say? But what I have to say I seen is stranger than that. It was in 83 or 84, I was 10 or 11 years old. I was fishing at a pond in Baldwinville, Massachusetts. I remember it was peaceful. But it's always peaceful with fishing, I guess. Anyway, I just finished fishing, put my tackle box in the ground, and I got on my bike, and I went, up, went to go, and just happened to look up, and I saw the biggest two birds ever. That was strange. They had no feathers. What was strange? They had no feathers. I swear on everything. I hold dear to me. I didn't know what it was until I watched the History Channel. I believe that's where I first seen the internet. But when I seen it on TV, I knew instantly that's what I saw, and it was a Thunderbird. And he left a picture. It's kind of fuzzy, unfortunately. I'm trying to blow it up. You guys see it? I've seen this picture before. You know that old classic one of the... Who knows if that's real or not, right? It's a picture. No, I, don't, I have no knowledge in the Thunderbird myself, although we have shit piles of people who have shared experiences seeing them. You're not alone. You're not alone. That's for sure. Too many people have shared that. And I know nothing about the Thunderbird myself. Uh, my First Nation superhero ladies, they reassured me they are very real. When we had our conversations in the past. Alright. Sasquatch in Sedona, Arizona. Brother, my name is Daniel Taylor, and I'm a newly retired police officer out of Los Angeles, 25 years. I recently moved to Oklahoma, Tulsa slash Broken Arrow. Not too long ago, my wife, daughter, and I were in Sedona, Arizona. While stopping to see the sights of heavy running creek water, you walk down a little embankment to see the stream. I was taking a pee while my wife and daughter were looking at the stream of water. As I was peeing, my wife... As I was peeing, my wife, uh, typo, observed. Oh, got it. Abbreviation for observed. That's new to me, man. Sorry. As I was peeing, my wife observed a tall, approximate seven to eight foot tall, dark and hairy Sasquatch to her left. My right, because where I was facing, approximately 100 yards away. The Sasquatch is moving towards our direction, but in a very slow and silent approach. My wife screamed out, run. I didn't know what was going on, but automatically knew it was serious. Training experience really has an effect on an officer for the rest of our lives. My wife knew I was packing, and it didn't register with her that I was armed when she observed the Sasquatch. 
We immediately ran up the embankment, and all I could think about was to lay cover fire to give me time to get in the car. At the top of the small embankment, I drew my firearm and shot one round in the general direction to hopefully get him or her to pause. I was able to fire one round, and it did give us time to get into the car and flee the scene without further incident. The date was February 2000, between the hours of 1600 and 1700 hours, located North 89A from Sedona, Arizona to Flagstaff, Arizona, and just past downtown Arizona along the side of the two-lane road next to the creek that runs through the area. Dan, oh, did you say to use your name or not? Yep, Dan Taylor. Okay, Dan, thanks for that, man. I wonder if you're, uh, during your professional years as a police officer, if you ever heard of anybody else speak of, of this shit, right? If you did, pass along, man. We'd be interested to hear, uh, what else you may have heard, possibly. I haven't a clue why they do that. Why do they sneak up on humans? Why do they stalk humans sitting in vehicles? Haven't a clue. All right, now, what else do I got? I've copied a lot of emails in here that aren't, um, they aren't uh, experiences or something to help somebody. It's a lot of emails just tell them, tell me I should look at a video or maybe watch this or, or maybe how I should do things. All right, here we go. Here's another one. My brother's co-worker's story. Hey, Steve, greetings from East Texas. Holy shit, East Texas again, eh? I just want to say that I have a huge amount of respect for what you are doing on this channel. The world needs more men like you. Thanks for the kind words, man. We're, the world needs, needs more people like you coming forward. So, I myself have never had a Sasquatch encounter, but this is an encounter that one of my brother's co-workers had while hunting in the Sam Houston National Forest. He was deer hunting on a pipeline off of State Highway 945 between Cleveland and Cold Spring, Texas. While sitting in the tree stand, he noticed what looked like a large man covered in hair peeking out from behind a pine tree. He said it would peek out and look at him, then go back behind the tree. <clears throat> excuse me. This hairy man, <clears throat> excuse me, continued to do that for around 10 minutes. 10 minutes is like frickin' 10 lifetimes. The hunter said that he felt like he was trying to figure out what he was. He never saw it leave, but it never peeked back up from behind the tree. About 30 minutes after last seeing this hairy man, the hunter shot and killed a doe. He said while cleaning the deer, he had the feeling of being watched. So he hurried up and got the hell out of there. He returned the following weekend to take a look at where he saw this hairy man. He said the branch he was standing under was around eight feet tall, making this hairy man between seven and eight feet tall. Well, that's the story as it was told to me. I hope someone gets something from it and it in some way helps. I'm so very proud of what Steve and the round table have built here. You can say my name. I don't care. I don't care who knows what I think. Jared Davidson from New Caney, 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 Texas. Jared, appreciate it, man. And another one, <clears throat> another club member. Send in more if you come across it, man. Here's another one. What is this? All right. Type mark this is red. Listen to this. 1976, Evergreen, Colorado. Steve, sorry to bug you, but like a dumbass, I decided to turn on the TV. What's on? A thing about Dog Man in Kentucky. No shit. They made it look so stupid. They set back research 10 years with their dumbass shit. Peace and blessings, I did email my encounter, and after the ridicule I got from the first time, I was filled with anxiety. But I got through it, and thank you very much, Brian Belt. All right, and here's the email they emailed in. Dear Steve, I want to start by saying that the people that follow you on YouTube are great people. They've encouraged me to tell my story, which I've done, which I've done before in June on Sasquatch Chronicles of West Germer. I like Wes, he's a no-nonsense guy and has his own experience and I felt comfortable there as I feel comfortable here. 
Unfortunately, lately it seems a lot of my veteran friends are passing because of a miserable drug called fentanyl. But you don't have time to hear that. But I'd like to bring that up just for their memory. So here it goes. At 17 years old, a friend and I decided to go to Colorado Evergreen, to be exact. We friends that owned a cabin that was six miles west of Evergreen, up in the mountains close to Mount Evans, if people are familiar, and also a rock outcropping we used to call Monkey Face Mountain. We lived in their cabin with a pump water outhouse and wood heat, and quite a large lab that we called Bo. We got out of there. We got out there the first part of September, got ourselves situated, and got jobs in town in a bar at a bar restaurant. And we worked afternoons into the evening as bar, as bar backs, kitchen dishes, whatever. Sorry, that's how it's, that's how it's, what I'm reading. And we had a good time. We were out in the open. We were 17. We thought we were invincible. So we get off work about 2 a.m. and we drive this 67 Chevy Impala back up into the mountains to go to the cabin. Well, on our way home, this is around September the 20th, the 21st. Funny, I can remember almost the exact time and date, but I can't remember what I went into the kitchen for 10 minutes ago, lol. So, as we're making our way home, we came over a small rise with about a 45 degree angle rock face mountain on our right hand side and on the left hand side going down 45 degrees into a pretty significant stream. We come over the hill and I saw something on the passenger side probably 500 feet up the road, crouching down next to the guardrail. Now these guardrails are pretty significant, at least four feet tall on both sides of the road. My buddy says, there's probably a bear. We weren't close enough yet, and I just felt like it's not a bear. That's not an elk. That's not a moose. I don't know what that is, so we slowed way down and we crept forward. We got about 20 yards from it, we were down to about five miles an hour and it stood up. We both knew at the time that wasn't a bear or an elk. So he had stopped the car. We're about now 10 yards from it. And it turned and stepped one step to the center line of the road from the guardrail. Me being brave self, I opened the car door and stood behind the door and just looked. And what I saw was amazing. It had the shiniest coat that I'd ever seen in my life. A black, shiny coat. I'll never forget that part as long as I live. It almost looked like it was groomed. So I'm standing behind the door of the car looking toward the center of line of the highway. And my buddy, of course, is in the driver's seat. And I've seen him with his head stuck in the windshield looking straight up. Sabe never turned to look at me. All I could see was the black, shiny hair, no neck huge arms to its side to its knees and it never looked at us that I noticed but it turned its whole body and I could see the left side of its face and there was a big bump it looked like a tennis ball cut in half on the words cheek on the what on the words cheek would be if I don't know if I if that was an injury or what because of everything else I've heard they don't have cheek bumps at the time that this happened, I was amazed, but I never felt scared. Strangest feeling I've ever had. I felt happy. A happiness that I have not felt since that day. So somebody tell me. It was only at the center line part for maybe two seconds at the most, and when it took off, it was like it didn't even touch the ground. Over the guardrail it went, down the 45 degree angle toward the river. There was running next to the road. We heard it slide down the ditch through the water, off the other side and up the aspens and pines that were on the other side of the road. It didn't make a sound other than when it slid down toward the river and the movement and how fast it moved was amazing. I've never seen anything like that. The whole experience probably lasted six or seven seconds at the most. It felt like an eternity at that time. In closing, I want to thank you for your belief in this living being. Well. Thanks for the kind words, but it's not a belief. It's just uh, accepting what I've seen and accepting the testimonies of thousands of people. So I accept the knowledge and I know they are very real. And giving believers a chance to tell their stories without ridicule. Because since I told my story in Sasquatch Chronicles, 
I've got all kinds of ridicule. I'm crazy. You were on drugs. All kinds of things. You were drunk. That wasn't the case. I know what I saw. I know what my friend saw. He's never talked about it with me. And when I try to bring it up, he either tells me he has to go or get off the phone or doesn't want to talk about it. This is 45 years ago in September of 76. I'm a U.S. Navy veteran, honorable discharge, and I'd like to say to all the followers, peace and blessings. I want to dedicate this to Chris, my friend, who passed Monday night. Thanks, Brian Belt. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate it, man. Sad to hear your friend passed away. That must have been something else to get out of the car and stand there and look at that thing. And another member of the club in no return, right? And another one, and another one. Error sent before done. Puzzles slowly focusing. Steve, it's good. There, are a few, there are a few, a few who share the stories about all those who decide to share what they've experienced. I've had several experiences and the learning continues to this day. But what they chose to share is up to them. First, age seven near Mount McKinley, Alaska, picking blueberries at grandparents, early 70s. Saw a very large midnight black being standing over the large blueberry bushes, maybe 100 yards away, using arms to gather in the berries with a smaller being near its leg. It scared me. It was across a meadow of short grass, <clears throat> ran back to my grandparents and never spoke of it. I had no idea what it was, but filled my soul with great fear. I knew what a bear was, and it was not a bear too large. Second encounter is strange to this day. I was a troubled young teen, 13 years, dealing with early traumas of abuse. Sad to hear that. Was beginning to make poor life choices. One night I had a walking, sorry, one night I had a waking nightmare slash dream. It was so real, I got out of bed, walked to my window, and looked through the blind to see if they were still outside. A, vo a voice woke me, told me to go to the window and look out. I did so. I saw in my backyard, in the garden area, standing by our plum trees, a dark black being. It was taller than the trees, I would say over nine feet tall. It had the shape of a Sasquatch being. He spoke in a deep voice and pointed to the southeastern horizon. He said to look. As I did so, the horizon lit up as a sunrise, bright white, and in the sky where the sun should be was a being, a man in white. It was as if I was watching the second coming of Christ. As I was in negative choices at that time, I felt ashamed and ran and hid in my bed. Such an effect upon my young mind. Soon after, I changed a path from personal destruction towards one of a more positive path. Then, off and on over the years, experiences in the woods of Oregon, now Utah. Unintended discoveries on a hike four years ago led me to locate a tribe of these beings not too far from my home. I don't really seek them out for the proof of them to the world, but to learn more about them. I've tried theory slash ideas over the years to see what they would do. Some nothing happened. Others has shown portions of mind speak. I hear nothing. However, they hear my thoughts and have responded to them in physical actions. I've had many typical photos. I have many typical photos at a distance, some closer up. Their looks seem to be, as most part, human-like faces and most all of them. Some large noses, others very slender straight lines of a nose one would see on any female human. Some of the youth have the look of the Ewoks. There are those who have the flat faces like ours and yet others more of the ape, the patty film shaped heads. Some actually do have the ape style nostrils. I have a close, a close game camera photo of half a face, a gray white colored being with a more flesh tone color face and a very obvious ape nostril in design. I agree most look like us. However, in their DNA, as reported by others, you still find the more ape-like looks, which is interesting, as the Sasquatch Genome Project showed no Neanderthal or ape in the DNA. Curious it is. But in this tribe, I would estimate around 20 plus in the families, and other groups in the area would number over 60 plus within a few miles square. And this is what I've learned as I hear from those who write into you. Those who share, such as the Arizona Four, Owlman, Edgar, and team, and native wise folks, 
I take what they say, what they have learned, or are being told of these beings, and test it, use it. I know there are bad ones, just like bad humans. They have answers, only they can share, if they choose to do so. There are other things, beings that live in and around these beings. I have evidences of the hairless greys, short and tall, slender like a POW camp survivor in shape. Only caught a few glimpses of them over the years. Also, the dog-headed beings, more rare but in the same areas. I wonder if they travel, not always around. Then another strange thing. After listening to you and David P. on the portal slash dimensions, which I was somewhat skeptic about in the years past. I've seen evidence of it. Had one old picture of a white rectangle on the side of the mound in the rock face. Thought they may have carried up a window or something. When I enlarged it, it looked wavy, like you went into the side of the aquariums or orcas are kept in. Watery, wavy, and lighted from behind. No, no, that photo taken with a phone camera four years back is now gone. Sorry, let me read that smoother. No, that photo taken with a phone camera four years back is now gone. It was at about 200 plus yards and the people would call BS. However, that computer crashed a few years back and many of the pictures were lost from my studies. Hard lesson learned. The last story in my photos of the last three years, I've noticed either what I would call hybrids or missing people, maybe. Humans, pink skin, hairless, except for where the hair should be. Male, females, children, but again, three to 1,000 yards on average. So human forms, heads, faces, some in the open, dark haired, gray haired, and even a younger female red hair. I know folks will say BS, but having learned of the DNA from Sasquatch Genome Project, it would make sense to have possible hybrids from the stories of interbreeding, as well as if they are us, half us. Scientifically, it would make sense that every now and then a full human could be birthed in the DNA lineage. With humans, we have different races mixing, and you have mixed breeds. Some full color, some lighter, some no changes. But a few generations down the line, a Native American couple produced a full white baby, to the point the grandparent thought the mother cheated on his son and did not accept him as family. If such can happen, then... Over generations, could there be a mixed tribe of humans and Sasquatch beings? And if so, would not these would not these full humans by luck maybe seek out mates amongst our people, thus missing people? There are stories of seeing of people seeing naked folks running around the mountains in Utah. All to assume it's just some crazy earth hugger types, but I'm sure that happens. But what if they were seeing some of these wild folks who seem to live with the Sasquatch beings. <clears throat> Excuse me. I've not seen evidence of them this year. I've also seen a small bipedal something right by me, about three feet away, small feet, maybe three inches or so. As it ran through the dry leaf litter on the ground, it was invisible to my eyes. I know not what it is. First thought was the little peoples. As Irish slash Cherokee, both my ancestor cultures speak of them. But what if it was a little being testing its skills or being dared to run close by me, like an old coup challenge, I don't know. Strange things happen in the central mountains of Utah. This is just a glimpse of it. I do visit when a rare occasion permits and eventually if they chose to, I would seek to speak with them and ask them questions to verify what is being told to us by others and question of my own. They do respond in a curious way when you read to them the history of the creation story in the Old Testament. Younger ones come down to listen to the story as I include them in the storyline. One day I'll return, one day I shall return to their front yard area and repeat it to see what happens. Curious they are, no aggression shown from these or surrounding tribes. They are far more out there than most will ever admit and closer to human civilization than most will ever admit. I do not suggest anyone go out seeking them, not wise. It's not a game. But for some reason, I and my family are tagged as they say. I cannot enter the wildlands without them sending a watcher to follow me around. It just is what it is. This is, the only, this is only the beginning in the world of darkness now falling upon this earth by those wicked in power. 
We shall need allies, I think, who have good minds, good hearts, who may possibly assist us in the global challenges now upon us. They'd make good allies in a fight of good versus evil. If they should choose to do so, but like the old grandfather, they may just watch us from a distance, destroy one another for a time. However, this time around, I do not think there will be room for any watchers, for the darkness will affect them just as well. I shall close this for now, much yet to learn from each other, and ask all people to use this format to share what they have seen and experienced. Each puzzle pieces, no matter how small, will help others build their own puzzles. They all prepare wisely for a very hard time. Use wisdom in all you do. Stephen Halls, Monroe, Utah. Okay, Stephen, that's a handful, man. <clears throat> or a mouthful for everybody to chew on, right? That is a big chunk. Direct contact, numerous contact, claiming of tribes, exact number of tribes. There's not too many people right in with that. Boldly, right? So, you know as well as I do, a shit pile of people are going to be shaking their head asking what kind of crack pipe you're hanging off of, right? And some aren't. But either way, take from what you will, you guys. And if you do have direct conversation and contact with any kind of uh, non-human being, ask some direct questions and get some direct answers and share with us. All right? That'd be very, very helpful. And uh, dark times coming, possibly. There's a lot of dark times currently. That is 100% for sure. It's just been slowly but steadily creeping up on us so that we're not really getting it slammed in our face. You almost got to sit down, take in the knowledge from all the different directions, think about it for a minute, and realize, yep, times are pretty shitty right now. Unfortunately, and it's absolutely 100% human-caused from the abuse of power. But anyway, that's another topic. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, what do we got? This is titled Steve Bro, She Died. July 17th. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I don't know what happened. The doctor said her tumor. Oh, this is a couple. Okay, guys, remember the couple that wrote in? This is going to be a sad one, I think. And we all uh, included. Um, the lady who had cancer, tumor in her in her head. We included her in a few email shares, and you guys sent out a prayer. So here we go. Sorry, this is late. <clears throat> it's tough to get to all the emails when they come in. I don't know what happened. The doctor said her tumors in her head had shrunken considerably, and that's a quote straight from her doctors. And they released her from the hospital. Her oldest daughter Josie, a very well-known and respected realtor, paid ten grand. For this Airbnb beautiful home up in Shadow Mountain Estates with around-the-clock nurses care so her mom could get really good care and since I had to go back to work as we were getting ready to be evicted since most of my time was spent at hospital since she had gotten sick anyways she's doing really good up until a week before she was released from hospital and when asked the doctor said it was just medic said it was just medication that didn't make make sense that didn't make sense if she was getting better, right? But I figured the doctor knew more than me, so I let it go. While at that beautiful Airbnb home, she just didn't look better, like she was, like she was. The doctor told me it was probably because she was just coming off all the painkillers she was taking. So again, I bought it. Every day for 18 days, it seemed like she was getting a little worse each day. I called the doctors; they had no idea. Took her back to hospital; still nothing started stay there by her side sleeping on the couch right next to her and the very first day I went back to work for the first time in months I get this call saying that they were trying to resuscitate her everyone including the owner told me to get there fast but on the way there it was like 25 30 miles from my work then about halfway there Josie her daughter called me and said they could not save her oh. I could barely drive. When I got there, a policeman jumped out of his SUV, came running up to me, stuck his, stuck out his hand, shaking pretty bad, and said, I'm sorry for your loss. And it was then that I noticed he was just a kid and had never done anything like this. So I shook his hand and put my other hand over both our and said, man, it's okay. I know she's already gone. I saw him take a deep breath, and he said, thank you. 
Anyway, as I walk up the front door of this beautiful home, just knowing as soon as I opened the door, my wife of almost 20 years was going to be laying dead on the hospital bed. Steve, that by far, by 10 times harder thing to do than anything I've ever done in my life. Steve, you know I told you so much. I loved her more than life itself, but had to see her no matter what. I opened the door, and there she lay on her stomach, face turned toward me, blanket up to the shoulders, eyes closed about 20, 25 feet in front of me. It seemed like it took forever to walk over to the bed. I fell to my knees right next to the bed and just lost it. I, like you, have never cried as a kid, and only when my dad died, then my mom died, and I shed a tear or two, but this was something that tore through my gut. So strong and so hard, I felt like I had just been kicked in the gut by a mule. I sobbed out of control for about 15 minutes. Something I did not expect because I've never cried. When I finally was able to get it back together, I looked at my wife as she laid there, eyes closed, looking very peaceful. And as I stroked her hair, apologizing over and over again for not being able to protect her from this and telling her I would have switched places with her even if, even then if I could. Steve is effing hard, brother. She passed on July 5th and has taken me this long to be able to even email you. I know you really don't know, we don't really know each other, but being cooped up because of COVID and you making my wife smile and watching your program every day for the past year and a half and turning many, many people onto your program, they're still watching you when she left the hospital. It was like every other room walking down the corridor, leaving the hospital had you on. It was cool. But going through all this, you have become like a good friend. Josie's, Josie's, Jerry's daughter, I was talking about Husband Chad and I are a good friend. He hunts in just a crazy fisherman. I got him turned on to your show and the both of them watch you every day. Anyway, I'm sorry this email is so long. I know you should be reading your other email, helping others as you do so well, but you know what? But you know what? Just by you letting me get this off my chest, like those guys from the round table, you've made me feel so much better. It's like I can breathe again. Thanks, man. I guess the reason my wife thought you were the cat's meow was that you and I are exactly the same in attitude and mannerisms, way of thought. Anyway, Steve, you might not hear back from me for a while except for I knew a Bigfoot. There's a couple things I wanted to tell you before I forget. Please stop giving your location of your home in your videos. Like, like don't give any more references. Like, this lake is here and I live right over there. Don't do that. Anybody can get on Google Maps and find your house, and there's a lot of crazy assholes out there. I know you'd be able to take care of any dumbasses that tried that, but I was thinking of Sarah and the girls when you might be gone. I know you love them as much as I did our Jerry, or do Jerry. I'll never stop loving her. What I'm, what I'm saying. So please tell them you love them every day and hold them, kiss them every chance you get. Don't be so macho, it won't kill you, trust me. <laughs> Because you never know when they could be gone, and it's hard. It's a hard, effed up feeling I would not wish on anyone. I'll be getting some insurance money and was thinking about getting out of here for a week or two, tops, and was wondering if me and Chad and Josie come up there. I'd like to meet you in person and pay you to take us on just a fishing trip for a couple of days. Jerry's daughter, Josie, since being a big wig realtor in Palm Springs, knows a few people that have homes on the island. I know it's probably going to cost a chunk of change, but I'll. I, but I get to get away. So, let me know. Either an email or a quick shout out on your program it would be really. Don't forget to mention Chad and Josie if you can. They're huge fans and they would get a real big kick out of it. They're mentioned. Again, I'm sorry about a really long email. Just as soon as I get hold of that money, I'll text you for info on coming up if you're cool with that. Steve, it's been a great pleasure to have you cross your path. You made my wife laugh with she was really down when she was really down and helped us both through this bad time in your in our lives. And I thank you so much for that. Steve, you're doing what you do to help more people. You help more people than you know, like me. And I look forward to shaking your hand. Take care of your family and yourself. And God bless. From your number one fan and brother, Scott Hansel, Palm Springs, California. Oh, it's a heartbreaking story, isn't it? It's a heartbreaking story. Here they are. 
All right, <clears throat> there you go. And that is the end of that chapter that they shared with us. And uh, all of you sent out huge amounts of prayers. And, uh, hmm, what do you say? What a sad ending. I'm sure you're, you will see her again. I'm 100% confident we all see each other again after this ride. Sorry I got to this so late. The emails, the emails get copied and pasted in my notes without being read, right? And, uh, but anyway. All right. So, uh, if you want to come up here anytime, man, you come on up. Obviously. Fishing's done for this, this season. Uh, the boat's coming on the water in two days. But anyway, sorry to hear that you missed out on being there. Although I'm sure she was with you the whole time, regardless. And you were there with her the whole time, regardless, right? So, anyway, I'm not the best one for words when it comes to these experiences, but... I'm sure everybody's praying for you, man. You uh, send me an email anytime. If all you want to come up, you can make sure you come up and we'll get you out there and we'll hang out and catch some fish and have some laughs and tell some crazy stories, all right? Yeah. Everybody out there, be safe. And take note of what this man urged us all to do while you can, right? I'll be back later. And if you want to email me in something you need to get up your chest or something that's going to help somebody, email it to sharemystory.com. All right, I'll be back shortly.